I'm going to <laughs> next week. I know sometimes that um, staying on the same topic can get uh, boring. <laughs> We've been on this topic for, I don't know, six, seven weeks or whatever now. And um, still got um, not quite a bit, but a bit to go through yet. Um, so we're going to go through several verses tonight as we have been doing. And then next week, I'm going to change it up and still stay with the topic, but look at it from a little bit different angle. And then the next week will be the fifth Sunday singing. So we will not have Sunday evening uh, class and it will be the next week that we get back into the these uh, scriptures that mention the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. So we're still in Matthew. Matthew has a, um, as we have already seen, has many, many, many verses with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, but mainly the kingdom of heaven. We've talked about that before. So we're going to start tonight in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, verse 13. Matthew 19, verse 13. Okay, now Matthew writes here, Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the children alone, and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After laying hands on them, he departed from there. Now, the, the, this event was also recorded by Luke and by Mark, and I'll just read those for you. There are just a few verses in each uh, one of those Gospels. In Luke chapter 18, verse 15, And they were bringing even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And the Mark version in Mark 10, verse 13, and they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked him. But Jesus saw this. He was indignant. And he said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. So a few things to talk about in here, other than uh, we'll get back to the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, is the focus on children. And we had something previously uh, in Matthew 18, we covered last week, uh, there was a phrase in there, come to like children. This is actually dealing with children. And he, he's making the, the, the statement here that the kingdom of heaven is like these. Well, you think about little children, you think about infants there. And I th think I mentioned this last week in, the, in that other verse, they're helpless they depend on their parents or a caretaker or somebody. They can't, they can't do things. They're, they're helpless. Well, we are too. As far as our salvation, we are helpless. There is nothing we can do in and of ourselves apart from belief in Jesus Christ. We are totally dependent. And we're dependent on him through the, the, the preservation by the Holy Spirit for life, the guarantee of salvation for life once we are saved. So we are totally dependent. And so uh, what I take from these verses, the kingdom of God, I take this with the premise that this is the kingdom of God here and now on earth during this covenant of grace period. Okay. Now, you could also make, a, make an argument that this kingdom of God is talking about the kingdom of God where we will go when we die as believers. I don't think 
you could take these verses and say that this kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven is referring to the messianic kingdom specifically. I think it's either talking about the kingdom of heaven where God is on his throne right now, has been forever, eternity, eternity future, eternity past, eternity present. Um, but I think it's really talking about, again, the kingdom of God here, the spiritual kingdom. And notice in uh, the Luke and the Mark verses, it says, does not receive the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is being offered. It doesn't say here that, in other places it does say, it doesn't say here seeking the kingdom of God or going after the kingdom of God. It says receiving the kingdom of God. So to me, the inference from that uh, is that this is something that is being offered to everyone. And, and what Jesus is saying here is you must receive it as, as, as children. We are totally dependent on him for salvation. We're totally dependent on him for the next breath that we take. We're totally dependent on everything. Any uh, comments, uh, questions about that? About these verses? Okay. All right. Let's move on. Let's not, let's not dwell on it. The next is uh, in Matthew chapter 19. Uh, verse 16. So we're going right on where we left off in Matthew. And uh, this little um, narrative here uh, also uh, has Mark and Lucan accounts, which we'll read through. In uh, 19, verse 16, and someone came to him, Jesus, and said, teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may uh, obtain eternal life? And he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who's good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, well, all these things I've kept. What am I still lacking? And Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, just want to point out one thing, and I pointed out this before. There are two back-to-back -back verses quoting Jesus, where in one he says the kingdom of heaven, the other one he says the kingdom of God, referring to the same thing. And that's an, another place where I say this is this is a direct implication of those two phrases are the same thing, whatever they are, whatever we decide that they are, they're the same thing. The Mark account for this is in chapter 10, uh, verse 20. And he said to him, teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words, he was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus looking around said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, there's this children again, but in a different context, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Now, let me talk about that last phrase first here, and I'll talk about the Luke account here in just a minute. The, with people, it's impossible. Here it goes again. What can we do to be saved? Not a. <laughs> 
It is a gift, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. The works come after. The works have nothing to do with salvation. We can work as hard as we want to try to earn salvation, and it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. It is a gift. It is a gift. And that's why with people, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And God provides mercy and grace to carry that salvation out. The, the Luke um, version just has three verses, but when he had heard these things, that's a rich young man, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Notice again that in the Mark and in the Luke versions, Jesus is quoted as saying the kingdom of God on both of those verses. And again, go back, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but the fact that it, it tells me that those two verses, uh, the kingdom, not verses, but those two phrases, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are one and the same. They're interchangeable uh, in this scripture that we've been going through. Now, what is this kingdom of God? What, where is it? What, what, what is this, what is this story talking about? Well, to me, this is, it could be either. It could be talking about if you, if you go along with this premise that the kingdom of God exists today, spiritually, with God, Jesus reigning in our hearts and the Holy Spirit indwelling us, that that is a spiritual version of the kingdom of God, then this is referring to that, that you enter the kingdom of God. And if you go along with that premise, it's obvious that if you're going to get to heaven, you've got to enter the kingdom of God at some time during your life here on earth. Because if you don't, at the end of your life, if you haven't entered that spiritual kingdom of God, that means you're not saved and you're not going to heaven. Make sense? My point? But you have to accept the premise that, this, that the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom right now. And it's going to be a physical kingdom in when the Messiah comes, in the messianic age, in the millennium. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus said, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No. Yeah, Floyd is making the, the point that uh, maybe we, we, that the kingdom of God now is something that we can't see. It's invisible. But when we get to heaven, we'll be able to see it because we will we'll be experiencing it face to face. Also in the Messianic kingdom, when, when Jesus is physically present on the earth reigning. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. 100%. It's this, the, I, I am with the premise that the kingdom of God again is now active, but it's invisible. It's spiritual. I can't see the Holy Spirit within you. I can't see that. And vice versa. You can't. It's invisible. It's a spiritual kingdom, but it's still Jesus is reigning in our hearts. And I, I'll say this again. The, um, the epiphany that I had months ago of going through all this is that how is Jesus, what is the one big way that Jesus is reigning in our hearts as believers? Because he has defeated death. He has defeated condemnation. He has defeated the, the wrath of sin within us. And he, and that's how he, that's one big way he is reigning in our hearts. That's how he reigns. All right. Okay. Let's go on to Matthew uh, chapter 20, uh, verse 1. Um, this, this first, um, this is a parable. 
And this is like what are called the kingdom parables that we went through in um, Matthew chapter 19. But this is the uh, the laborers in the vineyard. So let's go there. So he's relating this. Uh, the first verse says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like. Well, we got a simile here. The kingdom of heaven is like. Okay, let's see what Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven is like. He says it's like a landowner. Well, that landowner is God. That's interpreted as God, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers. Well, laborers, that's a man, mankind, for his vineyard. When they had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of, them, each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat all day. But he answered and he said to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, but I wish to give this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what I'm, is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. Well, the parable is pretty straightforward. This is about salvation. This is about salvation and Comparing, for example, those that come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ on their deathbed or within the last hour of their lives versus those that came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ when they were very young and they were obedient and they worked, 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 worked their whole lives. And yet the one who was saved in the last hour enjoys the benefit of heaven just like the ones that spent their whole life working for the lord well is that fair it is in god's eyes the last shall be first and the first shall be last absolutely now we could talk about rewards all those people that were saved earlier and they worked diligently obediently in faith for the lord as ephesians 2.10 talks about works created for us, we should walk in them, etc. Good works, then there will be rewards for them. But to gain heaven, they all gain heaven. They all get it. That's the mercy of God. That's his choosing. Works have nothing to do with salvation. None. That's it. So the kingdom of heaven in here, I think that kingdom of heaven is talking about the kingdom where we will go when we die. I think that what that, that's what that kingdom of heaven is talking about. But again, I would say with a premise that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God exists now in this covenant of grace period, that you still enter the kingdom of heaven at this time, through the grace and mercy of God, and and you have to be in that when you die, or you're not going to go there if you accept the premise that the kingdom of God is now. Boy, oh, you were you were <laughs> you were frowning a little bit. Okay, all right. Okay, very good. Speak up, anybody, anytime. Interrupt me, whatever. But let's let's move on. Let's be expedient. Um, so if we continue on in uh, chapter 21, uh, Jesus is talking to the religious authorities. And um, 
there's uh he's come in to uh, Jerusalem and um he's um this is the time when he has uh, cursed the fig tree and he's uh cast out the money changers uh cleansed the temple and now he's talking to these religious authorities <clears throat> and he throws out three parables the parables of the two sons the parables of the tenants and the parables of the wedding feast and in all of those are the are the phrases the the kingdom of heaven so in let's say, i'm going to read this one verse matthew 21 23 uh matthew 21 23 says when he entered the temple the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and and said by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority so they had a little tete-a-tete -tete there about that and they couldn't answer some questions that he asked them and so he says well if you can't answer those uh, i'm not going to tell you by what authority i do these things then we go down to verse 28 so matthew 21 28 jesus is speaking and he says but what do you think a man had two sons and he came to the first and said son go to work today in the vineyard and he answered i will not but afterwards he regretted it and went the man came to the second and said the same thing and he answered i will sir but he did not go which of the two did the will of the father and they said well the first jesus said to them truly i say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of god before you for john came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him but the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him and you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward as to believe him. So the 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 first man, the the first son up there in verse 28 would be like tax collectors and prostitutes, and the second would be Israel, would be the scribes and the Pharisees. And <clears throat> so the getting into the kingdom of God, well, that's salvation. And so it's it's saying there that the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed, like Larry has pointed out many times in going through John in our Sunday school class, the whole book of John is about belief, 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 belief. You got to believe. And that's what he's saying here. The the collectors and the prostitutes did believe, and so salvation was theirs. The kingdom of heaven was theirs. Now, what can we say about the kingdom of uh, kingdom of God here? Well, I don't think you can be specific and say that this is this is really saying that it's the spiritual kingdom now, versus it is the messianic kingdom or it is the kingdom of heaven where God is on His throne. But I think they all fit. Any one of those would fit to me in this particular verse for the kingdom of God. Any comments? Okay. Questions? Let's go on to the second parable that he uh, he read, didn't read it, he spoke it in the temple with those uh, nasty old Pharisees needling him. In verse uh, uh, 33, uh, Matthew 21, 33, he says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner well, that landowner is God who planted a vineyard that would be Israel and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and re rented it out to vine growers. Those would be uh, Jewish religious leaders, the vine growers. And he went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves. Those would be his prophets through time to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned the third. And how many prophets did that happen to? Bunches. The last one of the Old Testament, John the Baptist, lost his head. Well, uh, verse 36, again, he sent another group of slaves, that would be prophets uh, later on, uh, larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterwards, he sent his own son. Well, that would be Jesus to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come let us kill him and seize his inheritance. 
They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And they, those Pharisees, they said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, did you never read the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And that would be the Gentiles. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. So <clears throat> in this parable, when he's really in their face, those uh, scribes and Pharisees, he's telling them, essentially, the kingdom of God was offered to you and you rejected it. So I'm going to offer it to another people, to Gentiles. There you go. So the kingdom of God, well, what can we say about the kingdom of God here, that phrase? Well, I think, again, that would, if you, if you accept the premise that the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom now, during the covenant of grace, then I think that that fits this particular parable. But I think also it would fit for the heavenly kingdom that exists throughout eternity. So I don't think we could be, I don't think I could be real specific of saying that kingdom of God, what, what, does, what is he really speaking of there? I think it could be any of those, even the messianic kingdom. Comments on that one? Let's move to the third parable that he, that he talked about. In uh, chapter 22, verse 1, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king, that would be God the Father, who gave a wedding feast for his son, that would be Jesus, and he sent out his slaves. I think that could be evangelists in this case, to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding's ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. <clears throat> those slaves sent out into the streets and gathered together all they found. Went out, sorry, not sent. Both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, I think that's angels, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, there's another parable about a future wedding feast, which is pretty obvious to be that eschatological wedding feast uh, in heaven. And I don't think this one is actually speaking of that, but it is speaking about, I think, the end times. And, um, and the, the kingdom of heaven here is the kingdom of heaven that we've already been talking about uh, so far tonight. Um, the, the, the wedding clothes, that is interesting. Um, the wedding clothes were offered, and many took the wedding clothes and put them on, and they had to be 
rightly dressed or they would not be able to attend the wedding. And there were some that refused the wedding dress. Well, what is the wedding dress? What is the wedding dress in this parable? Think about it. what is that wedding dress? What is it? It is. It's the it's the imputed righteousness of Christ that clothes them. That's how it's interpreted in that parable. Yeah, yeah. So the kingdom of heaven there. You could be, compare that to the kingdom of heaven uh, as it exists today. But this banquet, uh, this wedding feast, when do you place it? Well, the wedding feast that we talk about in here, usually we're talking about a wedding feast in the future. Um, end of the Messianic kingdom. You know, I don't know. We could uh, we could really go off down a rabbit trail on that one. So I, uh, talking about the wedding feast itself, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure that this parable that he, he um, delivered is necessarily talking about a particular time, but talking about an overall occasion of a wedding feast, and you have to be clothed properly to be accepted. Otherwise, you are thrown out, and believers and unbelievers, plain and simple. You get into the kingdom of heaven, you're accepted, or you don't accept Christ, and you don't have that wedding garment, the righteousness of Christ. You're not clothed. All right? You cool? You okay with that? Well, you guys are easy tonight. Come on, Foy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's go uh, to Matthew chapter 23. Um, uh, we, we just uh, left to see uh, Matthew 22. So um, in between there, there were, um, there were some conflicts with the Sadducees, uh, the Pharisees and the Herodians talking about the son of David, whose son, uh, whose son is Christ, etc. And then we get to uh, chapter 23, where this phrase uh, shows up again. In, uh, in chapter 23, verse 1, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. And then drop down to verse 11. There's some more information not related to this till you get to verse 11. And verse 11, uh, Matthew writes, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. This is a Jesus speaking. Uh, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Now, verse 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Now, hold that thought, similar story, a little bit reversed here in Luke, in Luke chapter 16, verse 14. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Uh, since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. Okay. So, first of all, those the the matthew 23 verse 13 and the luke 16 verse 16 let me just read those the end of those uh, uh verses again in the matthew verse it says for you pharisees do not enter in yourself nor do you allow those who are entering to go in and in luke it says everyone is forcing his way into it into the kingdom of god 
So the interpretation there in the Matthew verse, the probably the Pharisees and the scribes, when Jesus is has done all these miracles, these wonderful things, and and they're getting more and more and more perturbed and they want to kill him, they are they have a following. Uh, they may have proselytes, they have uh, Jews, but these people have heard Jesus and they want to believe him. But the Pharisees and the scribes are saying, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't want to do that. You, you're under the law. You can't do that. He's a fake. You can't do that. Everything he's doing, those miracles are he's using uh, Satan or whatever. And so they're keeping those people from believing because they they had respect for their elders that's how that's interpreted so they're nor do you allow those who are entered to go in now they can't physically keep them from doing that but they can talk to them and and just what i said uh influence them to the point that they say to themselves okay i better not do this i better not believe I better just, I better stay with a straight and narrow, stay with the law, and I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Now, the Luke verse says everyone is forcing his way into it. It's a reverse way of saying that. It's like, I've heard Jesus. I've seen what he does. And yet, my leaders, the teachers and the scribes and the Pharisees are telling me not to do it, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to force my way into it. When that this is not saying that you force your way into it through work. That's not what this is saying. It's saying that you're being held back in some way by someone and you're forcing your way in and saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to believe in Jesus. I believe what he is saying. I believe that he is the Messiah. That's how you interpret those two. So now, what about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? Well, I think that this is really speaking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, as it exists in the gospel age today, after Pentecost. That's how I interpret this. But I will say this again, and I've said this before, you have to form your own belief. This is not a salvation issue. You don't have to believe one way or the other on this kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. It is not a salvation issue at all. If you choose to believe, and there are many, again, um, scholars, pastors that believe that we are not yet in the kingdom of God, that this, this spiritual indwelling is not the kingdom of God. It is not the invisible kingdom, that the kingdom is coming later. The kingdom is coming when Jesus comes back. And he physically reigns on earth in the messianic kingdom. So don't let me influence you. I, I know I get very strong about it sometimes, but you, you again, you have to formulate. And, and what, what, again, so everybody understands. When I started this series, I asked the question about what do you think of when you read a verse in scripture or you hear someone else read a verse and they say, well, the kingdom of God, you know, oh, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, does it just go? Whoosh? Or do you really think about well, what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? And that's what I've been trying to do in this series to get us to think about that. What is, what was Jesus saying? What did John the Baptist mean when he said, repent for the kingdom of god is at hand and jesus said the same thing and jesus said his mission what did he say his mission was he said his mission was to preach the kingdom of god okay jesus define that for me what do you mean by the kingdom of god are you talking about heaven or are you talking about something else but he never defines it except through all the scripture that you have to dig into and let it speak to you and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. But again, that's not a salvation issue. <laughs> I'm not promoting one way or the other. I'm just trying to get people to think, to think about it. What is this? 
It's got to be a wonderful thing. Jesus said that was his main mission. Well, yeah, he was here to go to the cross, but his main mission all the way through, he says, I must preach the kingdom of God. I must preach the kingdom of God. I must preach the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, over and over. Okay. Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. Jesus is sitting down on the Mount of Olives. This is what is known as the Olivet Discourse. There's only one verse here. 2414, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So we're getting to the point in Matthew here in chapter 24 where Jesus is starting to really focus in on the, uh, the end times. And so when he's talking about this kingdom, I think he's, um, I think that this kingdom uh, that he's preaching is the, the gospel age that we are currently living in. Um, and he's saying here that the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And when that happens, and we know from other scripture when the full number of the Gentiles have come in, then the end will come. And our interpretation of that is that, um, that uh, Jesus uh, will come back. Any comments on that? Questions? Input? Dave is pondering back there. I can see. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Until wh which period? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you're you're making the point that the gospel that the gospel has to be preached it has to reach everybody it has to reach all nations all peoples all nations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, pastor talks about that all the time. And he always talks about these, uh, the tribes in Papua New Guinea, which is true. Yeah, that's uh, that's Revelation fourteen six. Fourteen. Fourteen six. Yeah. So Chris brought up um, Revelation uh, fourteen six. So the discussion here uh, with Venkat and Chris was the uh, preaching the gospel worldwide to all peoples, all nations, all tongues. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Can we tackle one more? We've got, oh, is it two minutes till? Is that right? Oh, yeah, this is a, this is a toughie. The next one we're going to, well, this is going to be a couple of weeks before we do this. It's a, it's the parable of the 10 virgins. This is a tough one. 
Um, so we'll leave that uh, to the next time. And uh, we'll end for the, any, any comments, questions about this? Again, next week, I'm going to do something a little special, allied to this, but not what we've been doing. The following week is the fifth Sunday singing. And then it will be the following week that we come back into this. And hopefully we're, we're getting to the end. And what's the purpose of this whole thing? What am I getting at? Okay, let's pray. Father God, we, um, we thank you for your word. And um, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that uh, for us interprets your word for us. And as I always want to do, I pray that if we have interpreted incorrectly, that it will be checked in that and uh, be... Um, and it will be clarified exactly what it is, what the, your revelation is. Thank you, Jesus, for everything that you do for us. Thank you. You are our mediator to the Father. Thank you, Father, for knowing us before the foundation of the world. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your sealing that you effect in us. And thank you for this evening that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Good night, Fred. Bye. Bye, Larry. Bye, Gene. Bye, Gene. <laughs> Say hi to Joyce. Hi, Joyce. <laughs> okay. You did a good job, brother.